Um, my name is Pavel, and I'm pleased to introduce you to Why the World Needs Anthropologists, Mobilizing the Planet Digitally. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Organizing Committee and Applied Anthropology Network, I welcome you to the eighth symposium, which explores the wealth of applications of anthropology beyond traditional academia. Why the World Needs Anthropologists, Mobilizing the Planet Digitally. Today, we cannot imagine social movements without online mobilization tools. Therefore, in 2020 event, we set out to explore both critically and practically the potential of these mobilizations in collaboration with you and our special guest speakers. Before we dive into the first session, which is a book launch and panel debate, I wish to share a couple of uh, house rules with you. Um, there are four sessions in the program, four Zoom meeting rooms, as you know, as you're supposed to know by now. We have sent you all organizational info to your mailboxes twice. So please, if you're in doubt, uh, check your mailbox. Your video and audio uh, are in custom settings off. So if you want to show yourself, click camera on. If you want to speak, click the symbol of hand or type in your question or comment in the group chat. We have a people checking out the group chat, so nothing will get lost there. You can interact in private chat with other participants during the event, if you want. You have inf we have informed you that uh, the event is going to be recorded for future raising awareness use. So by being here, you sort of accept uh, <laughs> this decision. Now, finally, I pass awards to the session moderators and my fellow co-editors, Meta Guru and Dan Podet. Guys, floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Why the World Needs Anthropologist, and also welcome to my bedroom, which is set up uh, like you see in the background with uh, the roll-up of the event and of the book with the same title. And before we officially begin with the book launch, really congratulations to this year's organizing team. You managed to really mobilize the planet and bring together more people than ever actually to this event, the eighth edition of Why the World Needs Anthropologists. We've got almost 1000 registered participants. So congratulations to the organizing team and well done. And now my co-host is not this flower here. It's Meta actually. And she's in the same city, but on the other side of the city. And we are unable to meet due to the uh, recent situation in uh, Slovenia, in Ljubljana. Meta. Right, so this event, Why the World Needs uh, Anthropologists, it started in 2013. And since then it has traveled from Amsterdam to Padua, um, Ljubljana, then Tartu, Durham, Lisbon and Oslo. And this year we were supposed to land in Prague. But as you see, we are here digitally. Um, nevertheless, we did manage to make a book out of this event in this time since uh, Amsterdam. Um, and um, <clears throat> the book, and this is what we will be talking about uh, today. Uh, the book will be released at the end of November, published by um, Routledge, but you can already order the book uh, online. Uh, and I will uh, post the link uh, in a second to the chat. And the book will look something like this, but without these green edges. And uh, this is by no means a different book, like packed in, you know, pretending that it's our book. But this is how it's going to look. So while uh, you were presenting this uh, pseudo book, uh, I'm, I was checking the chat and we've got here people from uh, some really varied um, places from Norway, from Oslo, from Prague, from Amsterdam, Slovakia, Portugal, France, Estonia, Malaysia, Germany, Denmark, Egypt, Greece, uh, Newcastle UK, Sao Paulo, New Zealand, and so on. So this has really become not just uh, the main European event of applied anthropology, but apparently also a global event. And uh, going back to the book, who are the authors? Some of them are here today with us. Let's see. Uh, Thomas Hilland Eriksen from University of Oslo, Norway. 
Lenora Boren from Colorado State University, the United States. Joanna Breidenbach, betterplace.org, Better Place Lab, and Das Dach, Germany. Sarah Pink from Monash University, Australia. Stefan Jönke from University of Jeteborg, Sweden. Tanya Winter from University of Oslo, Norway. Sophie Bolli de Lesden, Electricité de France. Rike Ulk, Anthropologne. I hope I've learned this uh, to pronounce it good enough, Denmark. Jitzke Kramer, Human Dimensions, the Netherlands. Anna Kirach, Halogen, Designed Without Borders, and Kirach CO, Norway. And Ryle Nolan, Purdue University, the United States. And during this week, we have been sharing uh, in EASA Applied Anthropology YouTube channel and on social media interviews with uh, the authors. You have probably seen some of them. And all of the videos are still available in our YouTube channel. Mm. Now some more information about uh, the book, so we know who the authors are. Now the editors, so the book was edited by uh, Dan Podied of the Research Center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts in Slovenia, myself, Meta Gorup, uh, based at Ghent University in Belgium. And then we have uh, Pavel Borecki, who is based at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Uh, and finally, Carla Geron Montero of the University of Delaware in the United States. Um, unfortunately, Carla couldn't join us um, today, uh, but she's sending her warm, regard, her warm regards somewhere on the way to Ecuador, and she is definitely in spirit with us today. So let us, let's see who is with us today from the authors. Uh, the first on the list is Thomas Hilland Eriksen. Could you just say, if you're here, I can see you, but uh, it would be really nice to hear you. Hello, good to see you too, Dan and Meta and, uh, and Pavel. Looking forward to this. Great to be here, even if virtually it would have been much nicer to share some uh, Czech beer in a pub in Prague, but that was not to be. Next time. Microphone done. And we've got Joanna Breidenbach from Better Place. Yep, hi, that's me, hello. <laughs> and I'm quite sure that uh, Ryan Nolan is with us. Yes, Ryan is with you, hi. Hello everybody, I see a few old friends in the crowd and there's probably more that I can't see. So happy to be here, thank you. And have we uh, found Rike or managed to let her in? Rike, are you with us? Yes, she's supposed to be in. Now, hi, I'm here. Oh, Rike. <laughs> Rike from Denmark, hi, nice to Where be here. Where are you and what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I was really messing up technically, sorry. I didn't bring okay. my laptop, but now I'm here. Okay, thank I'm you so much. I'm out in the nature. <laughs> yeah, it, it's the best place to be during the yes. pandemic, to go out and to breathe some fresh air. So well exactly. done. Thank you. Um, and happy birthday to Rika. She's celebrating her birthday in the forest this weekend, yes. right? Thank you. Oh, happy, happy birthday. Happy birthday. 50. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and... Uh, is there anybody else here from the list of the speakers? So we are missing uh, Lenora. Lenora is here. Lenora, Lenora I'm, is here. I'm here. I'm oh, here. Oh, where are you? Oh, Lenora, long time no see. Yeah, yeah, it's got, it's my husband's computer. So his name is on here instead of mine. So that's a little confusing. Okay, so we will know that you are, your name is different than... Uh, yeah, his name is Bill Parton, P-A-R-T-O-N, which is on the screen. Okay. Uh, and is Sophie here, Jitzke, Anna? So if one of them joins later, uh, we will add them to the debate. And we've got some questions for you now, the authors of the book why the world needs anthropologists, which is coming out uh, next month. Meta, 
Thank you, Dan. Uh, can I ju just a quick technical um, request? Could you please switch off your cameras, those of you who are not participating in the discussion so that it's easier for us to see who is there uh, and who we're addressing? Thank you so much, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so let's let's begin. So the starting question of our book is simple, but at the same time, it is kind of complex as well. Why does the world need anthropology and anthropologists? Um, in today's discussion, uh, this is the question that we will be talking about, but with a bit of an addition. Um, why does the world need anthropologists in the time of the current global pandemic and its aftermath? Um, before we begin, another gentle reminder for, for the discussions this time, uh, there's a lot of you, so we just kindly ask you to keep your answers short and sweet so everybody uh, gets their uh, chance to talk. Um, but now let's begin with questions. Uh, Thomas, let's start with you. Uh, how do you think anthropology is being transformed during the pandemic, which it feels like a kind of liminal stage that we're going through? Yes, and uh, thank you, Meta. And, uh... Obviously, it's, it's very dramatic because uh, the, the, the one thing we do in anthropology is to connect with, communicate with and be with other people. You know, it's, it's the main method. We're using ourselves as a research instrument. So we cannot easily uh, do field work online. Although we have found ways of going about it, we found workarounds. I'm sure that we all have been working a lot on this, both with ourselves, our own project and with our students uh, in, um, in, in the last few months. So it's, uh, it's, it's a new and, and fairly dramatic situation. But one could also say that, you know, anthropology is needed more than ever, as it always is, because of the kind of knowledge we represent. And perhaps we can return to that later on. And perhaps we are uh, going back to the stage of armchair anthropology. So we are uh, more um, stuck at our homes and we can get information from different sources. Since you wrote... Well, we rely, uh, yeah. Since you wrote a lot about uh, the history of anthropology, did you get any uh, idea or reflection or could you reflect a little yeah. bit about this? Are we going back in time or are we mm -hmm. going to the future? Well, I certainly hope we're not going back in time. And you know, one of the things that we've learned from the era of armchair anthropology, if we compare it to the present, is that times have changed quite a bit, not least in the sense that there are now intellectuals, academics, you know, people in, in virtually every society that anthropologists study, you are perfectly capable of identifying themselves and say interesting things about your own society. So what we're going to see, and what some of us have already started to do, is more collaborative feedback with people who are actually on site, who are not going anywhere because they're stuck in Mauritius or the Seychelles or somewhere else. And, uh, and we can um, collaborate with them in, in new ways. So uh, not armchair anthropology, but more collaboration with, you might say, ethnographers uh, in, in the localities which we studied, which, which has, in fact, been uh, announced for a long time and which does exist. But, you know, all crises are, in a sense, accelerators, you know, the catalysts and magnifying glasses at the same time. So one of the things that is being catalyzed now and accelerated is probably this kind of collaboration. Thank you, Thomas, for this you're always so optimistic and I really admire it. Um, and I can see whenever I speak to you, you, you explain that the future of anthropology is bright. So I'm really happy to have you here um, in this discussion. Stephen, um, you begin your chapter with the following paragraph and now, now I will read it. The editors of this volume have asked contributors to reflect on why the world needs anthropologists. I must admit that sometimes I think the real challenge is to remind anthropologists that they need the world. So this sounds very enigmatic. Stefan, what do you mean by this uh, yeah, opening it's, sentences? Well, well, it's, it's, it's an attempt to turn the question a bit of an, on its head, of course. And, and I, 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 um, it's, it's a comment or an ironic comment on, on, on versions of academic anthropology that I think is very inward looking and always talking about itself. Anthropology is constantly talking about how important it is, how useful it is, if only the world would listen. So it's, it's sort of a statement of a, a, a promise, it's a cons constant promise that anthropologists are making of the, of the changes of, of, the, of the usefulness they would have in the world. Um, but I think that we should, we, we should stop just making promises and looking at the difference that anthropologists are already making. 
And of course, that means that we should look perhaps at other anthropologists than just the academic anthropologists. And that we should take a much broader look at um, what, what all anthropologists are always doing. Um, and I think that perhaps that, that in these years, there is um, uh, a questioning of the, what I call the uh, academic centric worldview in anthropology that, that we would, we would uh, have to have a much broader understanding of what this discipline is really about. Uh, and the majority of anthropologists are not academics anymore. They are actually doing practical work in all kinds of uh, collaboration with other disciplines. And I think at the center of the gravity of the discipline is moving. And uh, one of the things that we are learning uh, rapidly is that anthropology is just one discipline out of many. There is a tendency that we, we look upon other disciplines as interesting cultural phenomena that we study rather than uh, people that we collaborate with. Uh, and I think that's it would be very healthy for anthropologists to start looking upon itself as a profession, as a professional activity rather than merely an academic one. And somewhere on the border between the professional and academic activities is also jo Joanna. Uh, how can, in your opinion, the anthropological community open up to the world and become more engaged? Well, uh, you know, for the past few decades, I actually haven't been really in touch with, um, you know, more conventional anthropology. I mean, Dan, it was you who invited me to this um, community. And really, this is more or less my only contact. I am in touch with a few uh, anthropologists in Berlin. But in general, you know, I'm living my life as an applied anthropologist, very much as an un internet entrepreneur and as somebody who runs a think tank, which looks at digital communications uh, for the social sector. Um, and certainly, I mean, I've, I've always found in my perspective that uh, my anthropological training and this perspective has been immensely useful. And I can also see it right now, you know, when I look even, even during COVID, uh, especially those of us who are active in the digital field, um, we see such an acceleration of what we are doing. I mean, I'm running a, a crowdfunding platform for social projects and our in, in donation volume has increased tenfold compared to last year um, because there's such a huge wave of solidarity, uh, especially for small businesses, for people who are doing not good during <clears throat> the pandemic. Um, and so my life has been really much more busy than before, uh, you know, starting uh, uh, February. Um, and I must say, I mean, just looking at the situation in Germany and, and academic anthropology, I am really missing the connections uh, between what I'm doing and the kind of topics I'm excited about um, and what is happening in academia. Um, and I think that's a real pity. And, you know, I hope, uh, I think, you know, obviously this network is about to change that. But um, as far as I'm plugged into anything happening in Germany, I don't really see it. But uh, speaking about academia, the academia is actually missing you. So I spoke a couple of times with Daniel Miller, who was your uh, professor at the UCL, right? And a mentor, if I'm uh, correct. And he uh, always speaks highly, thinks highly of you and uh, admires what you do. And I think we have to bring these two worlds together. So these are not two separate worlds, the academic anthropology and practicing or applied anthropology. This is one world. And I'm really glad uh, when I hear that you have so such a good feedback now during this difficult time uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, also professionally, and that you're using your anthropological knowledge in this way. So uh, thank you. Um, Meta, um, let's see if there are any questions in the chat. Um, so people are sending greetings from all around the world, which is nice. Uh, you can ask any question you want to uh, any uh, of the speakers you choose. So this is your chance. Just type your question in the chat. Uh, Meta, have you get, yeah. got any other questions? I'm sure you have. Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask Rika something about something that Joanna brought up, and that is how things have changed since uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, how much busier it has been for her. How has it been for you as, a, as an applied anthropologist or as a practicing anthropologist working outside of academia? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, it has actually been very, very interesting. 
interesting because as uh, Thomas uh, Hilland Eriksen also says, we will collaborate with people on site, but on site um, are the people we we used to uh, to collaborate with during our studies. So one uh, point in our um, anthropological endeavors has been to actually uh, co-create even more with our participants in the studies. Now that we cannot get to their homes and do our field visits, they would uh, be self-documenting uh, with an eagerness and a devotion and um, actually a, a very uh, interesting uh, determination on, on trying to help out uh, discovering new aspects of their daily lives. So I have never before seen uh, that quality uh, when we sp speak about also uh, ethnography and, and stuff like that. So we do video interview and then people would self-document and then we do a very profound analysis of uh, everything they would send us. And then we have this uh, new video interview discussing their findings in their everyday life. And of course, also deepening, uh, get a bit deeper as we always do when we are there. But it's really interesting to see also the methodological um, kind of uh, disruption, uh, creating new, very good data, uh, generating data together as we have always done. But now uh, the, it seems like people understand the, 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 the need of it and they collaborate even more. So to us as a flat anthropologist, it's really interesting to see this more or less um, change in, 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 um, in power also, because I'm not the one studying them. They are the one actually uh, delivering um, and generating data uh, together with me. And, and we collaborate on how, how to yeah, present and understand uh, daily, daily life. So really interesting. So that sounds great. So it looks like um, there are some good things coming um, out of it, but um, I actually wanted to move to some of the not as nice things. Um, yeah. and, uh, Lenora, I wanted to ask you actually, so we know that many countries, most countries have struggled with coping and managing um, the pandemic, but the US have, um, has done uh, particularly bad. So what would you say, how can anthropologists contribute to, to the situation? How could they contribute to improving how things have been managed? That is a very good question. The US is uh, not very popular around the world right now. In fact, is nobody wants us. And even within the country, it is so divided because our president, even though he had COVID, just does not want to believe it's real. Um, so there's so much division in this country. We need anthropologists here to help us get back on track. And, and um, one of the biggest issues is it turns out that some of the um, minorities here, the, the Blacks and the Hispanics are more prone to, to COVID and yet all the, not much emphasis is put towards that because our leader is not willing to recognize it's an issue. He just says, open up everything have your lives the same as usual um, without recognizing how this is affecting different people. We have desperate need in this country for, a, for anthropologists to work within the country. One way I've been kind of doing it, I've done a lot of work with climate change and um, I've been working with groups like the American Association of University of Women and what have you to put on um, different proj projects. And one of them is Actually, next Monday, we're doing a talk with an ecologist on climate change and a doctor on the health of climate change. And part of this is directed at the fact that right this minute, because we're not, we're not addressing climate change, we're not addressing the pandemic, and the, there's fires all over the place, including here in Fort Collins, there's been a lot of evacuations right outside of Fort Collins um, in the mountains right, right within like 10 miles because of the fires. The floods on the East Coast are astronomical, which are all part of climate change. And the health effects of that and the fact that the fires here combined with COVID, the numbers are just going up dramatically. So we need to help in all aspects with the diversity pe people part of it and with the climate change. The, 
it's it's affecting us from so many different angles. Thank you, Lenora. Uh, we've got a question from the audience. Uh, I'll ask Ryan. Ryle, um, Ryle, are you with us? Uh, the question from the audience is, how would you suggest that anthropologists would be able to support in the course correction that is facing political leadership in countries around the world? Starting with my own country, I would imagine, right? Um, that would be the thing that I think would be of most interest to people in this country would be straightening ourselves out. Well, you and I were talking uh, a little bit before the session started, and I was saying that I have been urging people for years to use more ethnography in their um, political polling. And I don't just mean polling people about who are you going to vote for, but polling people in terms of what is on your mind. Um, we're all trained uh, in methods, and I think we all understand a lot about how polls are done. And if we do, then I think we also would admit that the polls are a very poor indicator of what people are, what, what's on people's minds. And so if you're trying to change a situation, the very first step is to figure out what are the right questions to be asking? What are the right things to be focused on? And you can't get that by phoning people up and asking them five questions. You have to spend time and of course, with the COVID, it's a little bit more difficult, but it's not impossible. But uh, so if I may interrupt you, so the Trump's side in 2016 election and before apparently knew how to do it, yeah. because uh, as it is described in the book titled Mindfuck, uh, written yeah. by Christopher Wiley, a whistleblower from Cambridge Analytica, uh, they sent to the field, they didn't do just this uh, big data analysis, they sent mm -hmm. to the field, to bars in the US, anthropologists, psychologists, sociologists, who mingled with people and collected phrases such as drain the swamp, build the wall. Yep. And then afterwards, they found uh, the person, uh, the Trump, uh, and he uh, stepped on the stage and said these exact words. And people were convinced because they said, wow, this is one of us. So. This is a nasty way of using anthropology, but how can we use these kind of approaches in a different way? So you well, suggest doing polling, qualitative polling, for example. The fact that the fact that Trump's people did this um, doesn't 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 disqualify the methodology, if you see what I mean. No, it's um, even it's different. It actually approved that it works. Yeah. Margaret Mead, Margaret Mead said years ago, what you have to do if you want to promote social change is you have to find bridging concepts which get people who are normally on two sides of an issue to come together on some sort of overarching principle. Um, Michael Moore in the States has talked about this where he talks about rhinos, what he calls rhinos, Republicans in name only. And he, he, he actually wrote a book about how to talk to people like this to show them that we are all in favor of cleaner air, cleaner water, safer schools. And so, you know, you, you have to frame things in a certain way. Trump's people were good at doing this. The Democrats were not very good at doing it. Uh, I think I mentioned that, that, that um, George Lakoff, you know, the, the, the sociolinguist has been talking about political framing for years and it's a very anthropological concept. So, you know, if you wanted an example of what we should be doing, I would say get ourselves hired on as um, consultants and advisors to uh, political parties and to movements for change, because we know, I think, how to find out what the right questions are. I think- Ryle, uh, Ryle and Lenora, so is there a place in the US for the president, a president who would be an anthropologist? So, so far, uh, we haven't come close. Uh, I think Barack Obama's uh, mother was trained as an anthropologist, but uh, how would it change uh, the United States, Lenora? Oh, wow. That, that's such a good question because the United States is so divided right at this minute that it's gonna take years and years and years to bring us back together. We have allowed um, hate groups to be accepted. We have allowed violence to be accepted. 
Um, and this is coming from the presidential leadership. With, without a change, I am, Ryle, you can respond to this too. I really don't know where we're going because from day to day, I mean, there was just a shooting in Denver the other day by a security guard to an individual who was just protesting. I don't think anybody knows who's right or who's wrong. We've got to learn to accept ourselves again. We've almost got to go back to the beginning and start from scratch. It's such a difficult, difficult situation and we need change dramatically. Okay, let's, let's go away from the politics and back to the book, Why the World Needs Anthropologists. So in the book, every author presented uh, mm -hmm. a starting point, explains, explained what made him or her become an anthropologist. So Thomas, what was your motivation? Why are you an anthropologist? Big question, uh, Dan. I mean, <laughs> how long do we have? Um, but, uh, well, uh, I think, you, you know, to me, as a young student, anthropology combined several of my passions. For one thing, it was the one discipline which did not take the sort of the Euro-American Euro -American way of life for granted. It was the one discipline at the university which was not centered, as it were, in Europe, and which also, to the best of our efforts, tried to develop theory in collaboration with the people we were working with. So that was one thing. Another thing was uh, the fact that it, it, you, you realize that you could actually ask rather complex philosophical questions if, if you were interested in that sort of thing, but with the people in place, you know, without, without, without just discussing with other academics. You could discuss um, complex philosophical and other questions by way of going deeply into other people's life. And the third argument, I could have mentioned the fourth and the fifth, the third argument for me, I guess, was that at any time, you know, uh, when I was an undergraduate, there would have been people in, around us our teachers, senior students and so on, who had just returned from a few, and you had stories to tell. And not just stories, because they could tell us something about what these stories were about and bring them into a, a larger context. So, um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a short answer to a very big question. I could have gone on, but I won't. Yeah, but yeah, I think some of the, th the, the other question that, that you raised just now, Ian, how can anthropologists contribute to making the world a slightly better place? Clearly, I mean, that has also for me been a motivation the kind of knowledge that could contribute actually to making the world a slightly better place. Because why else are we here? I love you. <laughs> so I Thank wanted you. to say Stefan was uh, raising his hand earlier and Thomas, since you came back to anthropologists trying to make uh, the world a bit, of, a bit better, um, Stefan actually wanted to comment on something that um, Ryle and uh, Lenora were talking about before. Yeah, but, but uh, perhaps it's also related to what Thomas says. I think that 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 uh, should be very concerned if we bring up anthropologists to believe that anthropology is a good thing in itself, that 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 it sort of has an important moral message to the world. Of course, it has in some respects in terms of of um, uh, sort of the. the uh, understanding the plurality of cultural voices in the world and things like that, but the methods of anthropology and the and the and the theories of anthropology are only good if you put them to good use. But I think a lot of us are brought up to believe that anthropology itself is good, that it's a good thing to have anthropology. And I think that's dangerous, as the example that Dan mentioned earlier uh, convinced of us is, 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 is very clearly uh, exemplified. So at the end of mm -hmm. each book chapter, Why the World Needs Anthropology's book, there are five tips for fellow anthropologists, also for non-anthropologists, since the book is written in a way that is open to also to a wider audience. So it's, it can be understood, I believe, by everyone. Um, and one of the tips from one of the persons here uh, among the speakers is very interesting, uh, of Joanna Breidenbach. So, Start meditating is one of your tips. So now I'm really interested, why is uh, meditation relevant and important for anthropologists? I suppose you do regularly, you meditate regularly, but how can it change you as an anthropologist? Does it give you any new insights? 
Well, I think, you know, the process uh, of, for me at least, of my, when I apply my anthropological lens to the world and the process of meditating is very similar, because in both cases you tend to try to be aware of the filters through which you see the world, the kind of categories, the kind of things which, you know, you seem to, which seem normal to you. And so there is this process of taking away this filter, which we normally see through and which we don't recognize. And in meditation, you know, you do the same because you are observing your thoughts. You are, oh, and, the, and by that way, you are distancing yourself from all of your, you know, whatever is going on inside of you, your thoughts, your emotions, your physical sensations. And this self-distancing creates a kind of self-reflexivity and uh, encourages also a perspective of more of a process awareness so that you're not so identified with whatever is happening to you, um, but that you see things more as constructs. Um, and for me, that is very similar to what I understand anthrop the anthropological project uh, to be about. Um, and that's why, I mean, I've, I've had a regular meditation practice, but only, you know, for the past 10 years. Um, and uh, at some point, and I think it actually was when I was writing the chapter for the book, you know, when I really thought, okay, what do I want to say? What does anthropology actually mean to me personally? That that uh, parallel uh, came to my mind. Mm. So, you know, I own it to uh, writing the chapter um, in the book. This is why you submitted the chapter. I think you were the second to submit the chapter. It was, we got it quite fast from you. Thomas is always the first. I have to tell you that Thomas is a writing machine and he submits it before we even ask him to do so. So, but he's another category for all of us. Uh, but apparently, uh, meditation can be also a tool for uh, communicating better, writing better. So thank you very much for this explanation. So we've, we've got a couple of these tips uh, at the end of each chapter. We didn't want uh, the book to be too scientific, too academic. We wanted to be, uh, we wanted to bring anthropology to the real world outside the ivory tower. I suggest um, we now ask uh, some more questions about the tips and then after that we are collecting some um, questions from the audience but since uh, Dan has been talking about um, Joanna's tip um, what we wanted to ask you was uh, all of you actually could you provide a tip number six um, for anthropologists who are working or for those who are not working, uh, which is a huge problem during the pandemic specifically. So we can start with um, Stefan maybe. Yeah, what I have been thinking is that, that uh, uh, COVID-19 has, has convinced how important it is to have a very broad discipline in anthropology. That it's not just, I mean, there, there's enough obvious jobs for uh, health and anthropology, the anthropologists working with health or medical anthropologists, as they sometimes are called, uh, there are lots of work for, for them to do. But, but there's also work to do on the epidemic of misinformation, of conspiracy theories, of um, the political um, use of, of, of this pandemic. And for people interested in, in social injustice, um, for instance, just to mention a few examples um, of how COVID-19 are uh, 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 following the, um, the, the already existing injustices and imbalances of, of power and, and, and economy in the world. Uh, so so this, is, this is a chance to look at these structures that are being played out both nationally and internationally. Um, Ryo, do you want to go next uh, or, or respond to Stefan? Well, my tip number six is very simple. Learn something new. Um, you've got time on your hands, maybe. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're as busy as you need to be, you know, keeping body and soul together. But in the sense that we are cut off from normal access to normal fields of investigation and so forth, this is a good opportunity, it seems to me to do what people on long sea voyages do, what soldiers do when they're, when they're facing deployment, what people in prison do, which is that you learn something new. You, you get a bunch of books or you've got a bunch of people and you find out something you didn't know before. Um, I kind of agree with the idea that anthropology isn't an altogether good discipline in itself. But I also think that um, we are somewhat self-absorbed as a discipline. 
And it is very good for us to get outside our comfort zone, outside our zone of familiarity. And so this is a good opportunity to do that. Um, if, if nothing else, um, being on Zoom chats with people over and over again for six months will make you a better listener and it will make you a better interviewer. So that alone is worth it, but there are many other things that can be. So that's my, that's my tip number six. Rika, do you want to go next since I see you nodding furiously? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I agree. Yes, um, my tip number six would be um, build trust. Um, my number five was reach out, but I think that uh, what is needed now is uh, in spite of all this digital and social distance, distancing that we uh, try to build more trust and try to actually... Um, yeah, create some kind of a presence, uh, even digitally with other people and uh, also help platforms to do so, so that we um, kind of address uh, the isolation uh, in a constructive and, um, and uh, yeah, in a, in, a, in a good way uh, because we reach out and, and build trust and try to make a new way of being present uh, not only with our heads, uh, but also with the rest of our bodies and in our lives. Um, so that communities could still happen uh, and that uh, we, we, we help direct social change. How about you, Lenora? Um, one of the things that's really striking me, particularly now with COVID and in the the US, the US, which was built on diversity and now is trying to do exactly the opposite. We need to look around us, look outside of ourselves and our situation to see where we're needed because we're needed everywhere. Anthropology, particularly when diversity is the essence of your country, anthropology is needed in every aspect, whether it's helping people understand how they should respond, how they still need to respond to each other since they're isolated from each other, but it help people who, you're gonna find a lot of people who feel so isolated and really need help to figure out how to become involved in again. And there's so many issues and problems, particularly here in the US, trying to get us back to accepting and understanding diversity. So look around and see where you can be helpful. Joanna, how about you? Well, I've had a couple of thoughts. I mean, I fortunately for myself, I mean, for the past two or three years, I've been really interested in the future of work and how we are working in a much more decentralized collaborative way in companies and organizations. And that's an area, you know, where I feel I can do very well, you know, kind of field work, my, my type of field work um, online. Um, so uh, personally, I am right now sitting in an area which is undergoing huge change because of all the remote uh, work which we are seeing and where people are also very perceptive and interested in finding out, okay, what is the new kind of normal we want to build? People know that they don't want to go back to the kind of work life they've had before where there's a huge emotional alienation between you know company and employer and in many ways and employee and uh, so I find that an area which is undergoing tremendous change very very important for many people where you actually can do you know uh, really good research uh, right now and um, so that's um, that's one area and I really liked what Rike what you were saying you know I think anthropologists can also contribute to a different usage of digital communications you know we don't only need to use this tool as talking heads but we can design new ways of using technology to become more embodied to just take a time to let me look at you meta you know and we could do experiments right now I think we are still using digital technologies very much in a way where we think it is in a way uh, replace an analog communications and we are not very good at how what is the special thing about digital which we might be able to explore and I also see that anthropologists uh, could uh, play a really nice role uh, in that area and maybe one more thing I mean I'm I'm because I'm collaborating with so many um, companies, digital companies, also tech companies, 
I see there's a big interest in companies to, and of course, you know, there's always a slight line between greenwashing and, you know, uh, and, and, and really doing useful work. Um, but I see, I mean, right now I'm talking, we are talking to TikTok, you know, as a company to see how can they really increase diversity and really make it in a serious uh, way. So we can bring anthropological topics to, um, you know, companies, um, of course, again, you know, do being very conscious of what, who we are helping in what way. But I think there's a big, big need uh, to introduce the values which we cherish uh, into the new digital uh, area. Thank you, Joanna. I think we have Thomas left and then we already received a bunch of questions from the audience. So we're going to turn to that after you, Thomas. Okay, so a sixth piece of advice. Um, I think um, perhaps inspired by something that was said earlier, I believe by, <clears throat> by Ryle, I would say build bridges, you know, because uh, there is something about uh, anthropology. I mean, one of our probably cardinal sins as a discipline is a tendency towards academic nationalism, you know, that you, you're very concerned with, you know, whether or not something counts as anthropology. And we're not as interdisciplinary as we would like to think that we are. And if we don't deal with the challenges facing the world today from, you know, the Anthropocene issues, uh, you know, to, to racism and, and uh, the political exclusion, we, we, you know, we need to work with other people and, and listen to them. And we are in a privileged situation because of our method and because of our concern with human diversity to build some of those bridges and not just within academia all the outside as well so i would say that build bridges thank you thomas and um now ryle is raising ryle ryle is raising oh ryle is raising his hand okay ryle and then do the questions just, and answers yeah just just to build on what thomas just said this is absolutely true um we need to get over in our discipline the idea that there is a purity to the whole thing um, you know, we need to figure out how to be problem solvers first and anthropologists second. Um, one of my good friends, John Van Willigan, said this very well years ago. He said, stop thinking about whether something is anthropology or not. Start asking yourself, how do I use anthropology to solve that problem or to understand that thing? And that is the difference between most practitioners, I think, mm -hmm. and a lot of academics. And I'm not, not trying to denigrate the academics, but thinking about your own discipline is really not a good way to become a problem solver. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Ryle. Uh, this was a really good point. And now let's go to questions from the audience. Uh, Alessandra asks, and uh, I think this could be a question for Lenora. How can an environmental lawyers collaborate to tackle the, the environmental crisis? What can law give to anthropology and what anthropology can give to law? An interesting question. Very interesting question. Um, actually, here at CSU, our department chair was a lawyer first. She worked for the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation up in South Dakota for years. And she realized that as a lawyer, if she was going to work for the, the reservation, she needed to know more about anthropology. She went and got, then went and got a PhD in anthropology. So there's, the exchanges are tremendously important because a lot of the, the ways we interpret the laws to the, to the diverse groups in the U.S. has to be in their terms. We've got to express it in terms that they will understand. So in a way, anthropologists can kind of be the mediator between understanding the diversity of the different groups and helping them interpret the laws and then help the lawyers going back to working with the groups to express it in the terms that these groups will understand. So mediation mm -hmm. is one important role that anthropologists can do. Uh, here is an interesting comment from Alexander Horstmann, I suppose from Germany, who says, well, for Germany, I can say that anthropology is not very appreciated outside of the academia. So we have to work to communicate its huge value in all fields. So uh, my tip personal number six is for the organizers of the future events, why the, world's, why the world needs anthropologists to organize one of the events in Germany. But I will ask uh, Joanna, how comes and what's going on in Germany and how can we um, 
built the bridges, as Thomas said before. Yeah, I don't know whether I'm the best person to, to, to answer this because, you know, I, in, I received most of my inspiration actually from when I was studying just for one year at UC Berkeley and uh, at University Con uh, College London, as you mentioned, Dan. Um, uh, but I mean, for me, the question is not so much, you know, um, can I make anthropology understood? I mean, I did like what Ryle was saying, you know, I mean, if, if there is... Uh, there are so many topics in the world, you know, which need to be looked at. There are so many, uh, we need so many answers. And I just think that, you know, the anthropological perspective is so useful because it combines, as Thomas, as you said, you know, I love it because it combines the very concrete, you know, very practical, empirical with the very philosophical and the big, big questions of our times. And I feel every person, every anthropologist individually, you know, can contribute to that and, and can make just Show, you know, show how to be a problem solver, so show how to contribute um, to the really important uh, topics. And I mean, I certainly, when I look at my area of work and when I receive CVs by young people who want to, you know, do an internship or who are applying for a job, um, I certainly am, you know, yeah, I mean, I like it when people come from anthropology. So for me, that definitely is a plus. And I've also observed that recently in other uh, people I see that I I do think that there are openings for anthropologists um, in the in interesting topic areas. I think the general question is more that, you know, there's still so much more money in jobs, which most anthropologists wouldn't want to do uh, because they are part of an old extract you know, not socially inclusive economy. Um, and there are very few jobs actually in that what we want to build. And so very often, I think it is also a question of where are actually the jobs. And so I know a number of anthropologists who are working in, you know, ad agencies and really hate it, uh, but they feel that they can't really afford to move into an area of work um, which they feel is more uh, aligned with their own values. Um, so I think part of the di dilemma which we are facing is that the world is going through this transition and that still most money is in jobs um, where many anthropologists might not, not feel very comfortable um, engaging with. But we spoke about this dilemma a couple of times and in my opinion the problem is that people lose the label anthropologists when they uh, get employed as journalists or in marketing. But you could be uh, an anthropological marketer, you could be an anthropological journalist. So I think we should be just proud of the label anthropologists and keep it because this will also strengthen uh, the brand of anthropology and open new jobs for um, future anthropologists because as many of us know academia is really full so this academic uh, place is full but we have to open new opportunities for ourselves and so this is why we inspired invited all of you to speak at why the world needs anthropologists like Joanna and Anna Kirach and Hitzke Kramer to show it's possible I mean that um, and some Alexander said yes agreed I'm proud to be an anthropologist even in Germany, you can be proud to be an anthropologist outside of academia. And Aura Cruz is here from Canada saying that I'm proud anthropologist and although I cannot carry the title in my work, I don't know why, I do apply the discipline as much as possible in all my work and projects. Uh, Martin Dolsky asks, asks me, Dan, what do you mean academic is full? So maybe this is a question for Thomas Eriksson, who has spent quite some time in academia. Uh, is academia really full or are there uh, new? I know there are new job opportunities, but um, there, there are not so many as, in, uh, as there could be or should be. So Thomas, yeah, your opinion on the next generations. Yes, and, and thank you for the question. Well, you know, I think uh, there are there are several problems. I mean, one problem to do with anthropological knowledge. I mean, I'm now, I'm now going back to the question we initially raised, either Meta or Dan, about uh, what the United States would have looked like had they had an anthropologist as a president. And it is to do with the fact that the kind of knowledge that we typically produce is not seen as very useful, you know, by corporations and politicians, because they want numbers. They want simple answers to complex questions and percentages. And the kind of knowledge 
which we provide is often ambiguous. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have a, a you know a, a sort of a clear answer, um, and uh, and it is uh, and it requires a bit of attention you know, simply to get at what we're saying. You can't you can't reduce it to three bullet points on the on the PowerPoint slide. So that's one of our comparative disadvantages. The other one is obviously, but I don't, I'm not sure if that's a disadvantage. But the fact that we're not the profession like economists and lawyers. You rarely see advertisements where where you know companies or, or state agencies they ask for an anthropologist but there are quite a few of these jobs that anthropologists could apply for and uh, and this is why it's so important i mean uh, dan and, and, and others that you that we have these conferences uh, why the world needs anthropologists to contribute you know to making it known to to a broader public uh, what it is that we can do and uh, what kind of skills we have to make us more employable in a variety of professions because anthropologists are all over the place I see Stefan raising his hand and I actually, I think maybe we can link this. Uh, Nikolai asked a question that actually uh, many of you have already touched upon and uh, he's asking, do you see any new fields open it up in the near future where anthropologists could be needed? So Stefan, actually, can you respond to Thomas and also answer this one? Um, <clears throat> I think there are a number of fields that they are constantly raising of where anthropologists are needed. Uh, the development in Denmark for the past decade has been that anthropologists is actually now being mentioned in ad, uh, job, ad, job ads. Um, that 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 um, employers are actually actively looking for anthropologists, and they are having they are building relevant expectations of what anthropologists can provide that that are specific for people from that discipline. So no, it's not a profession in the sense that we have traditional professions of lawyers and, and medical doctors and so on. So it's not, it's not defined that, that specifically, but we are moving, I think, perhaps not in a direction of profession, at least in a direction of more professionalism. And I think that that's really important because it broadens the understanding of what was this discipline is really about. And I think the experiences of people working in journalism or advertisement or whatever, who are claiming the title of anthropologist there, um, and claiming that they have an anthropological approach to their work, that actually is something that all of us as anthropologists can learn from. What are they doing with anthropology? What is anthropology, be what is anthropology becoming in all these new fields? So that we understand that, it's, that it's not, we, we cannot continue to look upon anthropology with this academic-centric worldview that I talked about earlier, that, that the real anthropology is academia, and all the other ways of using anthropology are more or less peripheral to that, or sort of uh, compromises on the real thing. And I think we have to change that whole understanding of what it is that we are doing. And if we are successful as that as a discipline, I think there's no limit to where anthropologists can work and prove that their approach is useful and essentially. Thank you. Um, here's a very interesting comment from Simon Pullman Jones. Uh, who did a quick search for business anthropologists on LinkedIn and it returns 17,000 results. So apparently the business world is also quite full, not just academia. Perhaps we need new titles, new ideas, new um, labels which we add to anthropology. So this is just a comment. But here's uh, a question from Nana. What do you think about the potential of social media to res reshape the role of a digital anthropologist? So maybe a question for Rike. To reshape the role of digital anthropology. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's the same more or less. Of course, social media is part of digital. Uh, that's where we meet, that's where people would evolve, that's where you exchange uh, knowledge and, uh, and interest and so on. So I've heard uh, agencies talking about social listening, where you would listen to what, what is the talk of, of, of a community. And I think uh, we should uh, use and apply our participant observation methods, uh, not by only listening and uh, extracting from what other people say, but actually going there and, and raising questions and uh, trying to, to, to engage people in, in actually not only answering our questions, but to learn to put the right questions. So to me, digital anthropology and social media is uh, two sides of the same story. And definitely we should use it and be there. Joanna, what is your opinion? So uh, this is the time uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, 
the government advertise social distancing. In my opinion, we should advertise distance socializing. So to turn it around, mm -hmm. can anthropologists help, Joanna? Well, I mean, I'm personally really interested to look at the whole value chain, for example, of disinformation, which is such a huge, huge topic eroding democracies, you know, around the world. And even though I'm so much potential oriented, and when we started betterplace.org, our crowdfunding platform, we only saw the positive aspects of digitization. And of course, now, you know, we have become much more um, ambivalent, skeptical, and also afraid in some uh, areas. So I think, you know, for anthropologists to study really the whole chain of disinformation, where does it originate? You know, very often state power is present. It's really looking at, uh, at power dynamics, who funds what kind of disinformation campaigns until all, you know, the distributors, the main platforms open and closed ones until the populations where it is being consumed. I mean, I think that's a really, really influential, really important um, ecosystem uh, to look at where anthropologists uh, can play a huge role and also engage with uh, tech companies you know I mean we are seeing now this tech clash we are seeing many more voices of people being very critical about technologies and we are also seeing that in tech companies where uh, you know employees are walking out saying you know we I mean where it's I know some employees in the German Google office who left their jobs because they really felt that you know they a few years ago they thought it was cool to work for Google now they are ashamed of it uh, yeah uh, so and um, I think there are so many entrance points where we can critically interrogate this uh, new, uh, so hugely important and, and, and influential um, uh, new digital e ecosystem. And I don't really know how, how active anthropologists are there. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm not following the scene that closely, but I certainly see that it's, it's, a, it's a huge, not only an opportunity, I think it is a must to be there and to do participant observation and uh, in, online line and uh, analog. So uh, apparently we are overwhelmed with digital technologies. Uh, while you were speaking, I got a message on WhatsApp, which is our tool to communicate about the backstage of this event. And uh, I texted to uh, Meta that we should uh, conclude now, but I uh, accidentally sent her a message that we will collude now. So. <laughs> Uh, because of the autocorrect, so, um, but you get the point. So we're almost uh, finished with the debate. And before we collude or conclude uh, the debate, I just wanted to let you know the Why the World Needs Anthropologies book will be available in print by the end of November. So you can already pre-order the book now. Uh, the link was already here somewhere in the chat. And I'm really looking forward to holding in hands this book because uh, it has been a really long process for making it happen. And it started actually in 2013 with the first event, Why the World Needs Anthropologists. And uh, it moved then to Padua, to Ljubljana, Tartu, um, Durham, um, Lisbon, Oslo, and it should land this year in Prague, but instead we're here in the digital reality. And I think this is also something we have to get the best out of, also mm -hmm. anthropologically and also as an online community to keep this event going. Meta, back to you. Yeah, definitely. I think it's been great. And I'm actually so excited that at least because of COVID, we're gonna have two events in a shorter span than usually so we're not going to wait another year for the next one so yeah i also wanted to thank everybody very much for um joining us for all the questions we did not manage to to address everyone's uh questions but maybe we can think of a way how people can um, contact us, uh, contact the speakers later. Um, and uh, yeah, we're hoping that you can all help us spread the word uh, of anthropology. Now I sound like the Church of Anthropology, Stefan, uh, and of the book, the ideas presented in the book. Now, this, is, this will sound like the Church of Anthropology. Listen to my concluding uh, statement. So please remember that anthropology is not just science, it's, it's also a way of life and our common mission. And therefore, let's share the knowledge and let's use it in everyday life, even when we meditate. Uh, 
So thank you very much for um, joining this session. And thank you very much for uh, asking so many comments. So I think we can write another book uh, from uh, all those questions that uh, have just arrived. And I think we should collect them and answer in one or another way. And um, now let's get back to Pavel Borecki, who will um, introduce you to the rest of why the world needs anthropologists mobilizing the planet digitally. You know, sometimes uh, I, I enjoy being a trickster. Uh, <laughs> and I think this is a moment when I'm, when I'm going to be one. I'd like to encourage in last five minutes, all contributors to our book to react to each other. What did you like about uh, your, your fellow contributors' uh, contributions? Is there something like a brief comment on, on someone else's work? Is there something you would like to share in the last five minutes? I'm not yeah. sure if, if uh, they also read each other's works. Yeah, I did. I read everybody's. I thought they were great. <laughs> okay. You see? You see? But, but I wanted to say I have, not, I have not met any of you personally. Well, that's not true. A few of you, like, like, like Lenny Boren. But... Um, Tomas, I was very, uh, I, I've been a fan of your work for years. It's nice to see you. Stefan, I really appreciated your remarks. I thought they were very, very interesting. Um, and Joanna, you know, I'm so happy to meet another applied anthropologist who's, who's got a, the, the same sorts of perspectives that I do. So I'll stop there. Um, Rike, I, I don't know you at all, but I, I think that I'd like to sort of keep this conversation going in the future with all of you. You're fine people. Thank you. Thomas? Yeah. Yes, just a, few, just a few words from me as well. I must confess I haven't read everybody yet, but I'm looking forward to that. But from what I've seen and for having this, from having this conversation today, I think, you know, one of the great things about this anthropology thing and the reason that, that we identify so strongly with what we are, I mean, for better and worse, I guess, is the fact that we sort of straddle a boundary between the existential and the professional, between the intellectual and that which is really at stake for us personally. So, uh, so it does something to you as a person. And, and Ryle, by the way, we return the compliment. You know, I'm, uh, I'm teaching a course on anthropology and practice. Uh, where where uh, undergraduate students are, are, you know, they go out on, uh, uh, yeah, they work for, for a little while as interns in various uh, firms and so on. And we, we have one Bible, you know, we have a few articles that we read by Margaret Mead and several others, but there's one Bible and that's your book, which is indispensable. Without that book, the course would have been impossible. So thanks a lot for writing it. I think it's fairly unique. We have Stefan and uh, Lenora who still wanted to comment. Um, yeah, okay. What yeah. I really appreciate is the theme that runs, I'm sorry, am I doing this correctly? Okay, is the, the, the common theme that runs between everybody. We were all saying similar things from very different perspectives and, and I'm excited about that theme and, and, the, and, the, and one of the pieces of that theme that comes out is our need to present ourselves to the larger community and have have them really understand that anthropologists are real people who do real things and can be very helpful in a lot of aspects of our, our local communities and our national communities and our international communities. Stefan, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I just wanted to, uh, to thank uh, Joanna and, and Reike for, for being um, uh, the kind of anthropologists who are working outside of academia yet claiming to be anthropologists, and we we badly need you. I'm I'm speaking as a person who is work, <laughs> trying to bridge uh, 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 inside and outside of academia, and I think it's so important that the people who are working in practice uh, continue to claim anthropology as the name of their practice, uh, and students all over the world uh, um, uh, need that badly to understand that what they're learning is not just to go in the footsteps of their professors, but going in the footsteps of the 90% of the anthropologists who are working outside of academia. To understand what is anthropology there and to broaden our understanding of where this discipline can be going. 
And I mentioned earlier the development in Denmark is lastly is thanks to people like Rikke, who uh, early on saw the possibilities of developing uh, consultancy work in anthropology uh, and or anthropology in consultancy work mm. and continue to claim this is anthropology, this is the name of my company. And it sends such an important message to students and to the rest of the discipline. So thank I, you. I have, thank you, Stefan. I have a final comment. Uh, uh, last week I did, uh, I did uh, a, a contract with Lego and what they loved about us was actually the anthropological uh, side of our methods and also the unconventional way of being a consultant, being very honest, being very no bullshit, not wanting segments and numbers, but having a different approach. And I've worked for 17, 18 years now as consultant and I think what what is happening is that we are becoming more and more kind of uh, proud uh, to be alternative and human and very uh, like, um, yeah, very hands-on and very normal actually. And, and also avoiding a little, uh, trying to be like the others and do like the others because it is interesting and it's new. And as Thomas said, it's complex. I don't advise just one thing. I advise a lot of different things and that's what people want to hear now. It's not yes or no, it is the complex answers because the world is a complex place. So it's really nice to find out that also our clients out there and, and the social sector, the society, the municipality, that they want people like us to help them uh, solving problems in a more human uh, way. Rike, I will have to tell this to my sons uh, yes. I'm sure they will be fascinated that there is uh, a Lego anthropologist exactly. out there, and I yeah. think it will make them even like anthropology more than they currently do. There you go. <laughs> nice. Ama amazing uh, last, last remarks. So let me conclude. We are on time, which is cool. Um, it's, not, it's not always the case with us, you know. So enjoy the book and stay with us. Uh, the wider world needs anthropologists. Thank you for joining the launch. Thank and you. now we will continue with the program because this is just the beginning. The conversation will continue um, later on today and tomorrow. In 15 minutes sharp, we will listen to the keynote speech of Professor, Professor Marianne Meckelberg. Uh, the speech will be given in memory of our dear friend and colleague, David Graeber. So please join us. The event continues tomorrow with a roundtable discussion on mobilizing online social movements and digital activism today, uh, moderated by my fellow colleague, Mena Baginova, and the Applied Anthropology Network meeting. Just in case you missed the link, uh, there was a question, is it, is it the same link? It's not the same link. You have um, emailed with four different links, but I just now share the right link to the keynote in the, in the public group chat. So pay attention to the right link. And we will see each other either in 15 minutes again or uh, tomorrow, hopefully. So thank you very much to all contributing uh, authors and see you around and uh, do buy the book. It's beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.